Mr. Wiley? Yes. Why did you keep your daughter in a room? Mr. Wiley has no comment. No comment. We haven't had... Throughout human history, feral children have been a fascination to researchers, scientists, and even a crucial component of culture. Nearly 3,000 years ago, Romulus and Remus were suckled by the wolf mother, and only 50 years ago, one of the most significant cases of feral children became an American news headline. Some psychologists believe children are born as a tabula rasa, a blank slate, with which their development sees the inscribing of language, nationality, and even their morals. It is therefore essential that each child undergoes this, but there has been many instances where children have not, producing drastic consequences. Our story starts in the 14th century in the Holy Roman Empire. The current Emperor Frederick II was highly interested in scientific research. Now, 700 years ago, there was no ethics committee for undertaking experiments. Whilst obviously bad, this did allow for research to take place that would not have been allowed today. One of Frederick's most significant experiments was when he performed on infants. He had a group of young children taken from their mothers and raised without any human interaction. Nurses could only feed them, but they could not play with them, nor could they hold them. They couldn't talk to them or even smile at them. The goal was to decipher what language the children would learn. Would it be the language of God, Frederick wondered? Would it be Hebrew, Arabic, Latin? To his surprise, none of the children learnt a language at all. Instead, all were inherently irrational. As reported by the monk Salim bin de Adam, Frederick laboured in vain, for the children could not live without clapping their hands and gestures, and gladness of countenance and blandishments. Before long, all the infants in the experiment were dead. It has been reported that James IV of Scotland performed a similar experiment, seeing two infants raised by a mute woman on an isolated island with no other contact. Supposedly the children spoke Hebrew, but the author Sir Walter Scott commented, it is more likely that they would scream like their dumb nurse or bleat like the goats and sheep on the island. Let us fast forward around 400 years. France, 1797. In the department of Tarn, local hunters have started noticing a strange child lingering in the woods during their hunt. Upon their initial contact, the boy ran, but was eventually caught and taken to a nearby town where he was to be taken care of by a widow. The strange child did not speak and was only ever hostile to the woman before eventually escaping, fleeing into the woods once more. He was not spotted again until 1800, three years later, this time in another department called Avalon. He now looked around 12 and was covered in scars. He still produced no speech and had chaotic movements. According to the philosopher Francois Dagogne, he walks on four legs, eats plants, he's hairy, he's deaf, he's mute. The boy was soon captured again, this time to the psychiatrist Philippe Pinel at Hôpital Bicetre. He reported him to be mentally ill. It wasn't until Jean-Marc Gaspar Itard, a young medical student, essentially adopted the boy, naming him Victor. Itard cared for Victor and wanted to try and restore him to an expected intelligence of his age. For countless hours did he try, but Victor only grasped language and reading to a rudimentary level with Itard writing. His ear was not an organ for the appreciation of sounds only a simple means of the self-preservation which warned the approach of dangerous animals or the fall of a wild fruit. Victor only ever learned to spell lay, the French for milk, or eau dure, the French for oh god. Itar and Victor did however end up making some progress eventually. Victor began to understand actions, but Itar still had no luck in getting Victor to speak. It became evident Victor was not actually deaf, but simply refused to talk. Essentially, Itar found that Victor did not understand vocal tones. There would be little point in trying to teach him to speak by normal means of repeating sounds if he didn't really hear them, he went on to write. Most critics question why Itar never taught Victor sign language before he tragically died of pneumonia in 1828. Nevertheless, now we have seen evidence of what deprivation of a healthy development can produce in a child.
The year is now 1970. Dorothy Wiley, nearly blind, travels to Temple City, California with her daughter Jeannie to seek an application for disability benefits. Perhaps a true tale of irony, Dorothy enters the social services building next door. Dorothy is promptly greeted by a social worker, but something is immediately off when they observe Jeannie. For Jeannie was 13 years old, yet looked so small and frail the worker believed she was around 6 or 7. Her demeanour had the worker believe she was possibly autistic, leading her to question Dorothy or no daughter. Shocked upon learning her true age, the police were immediately contacted and sent to the Wiley household, only to find one of the most cruel sights they were to ever see. You see, Jeannie's father, Clark Wiley, had a troubled childhood himself. It was reported that his mother gave him an effeminate name as a child, leading to several episodes of bullying and discrimination. Clark eventually got his name changed and seeing the damage he caused, his mother tried her best to always make him happy. The two became insanely close to one another after. Upon reaching 11 months old, Jeannie was suspected of having conicterus, a disease which can lead to brain damage and even death. The thought of his daughter subjected to brain damage angered Clark Wiley, not wanting her to be difficult. However, when Jeannie was around 20 months old, Clark's mother was killed in a hit and run traffic accident. This is reported to have affected him significantly more than it would the average person. The driver was found to only receive a probationary sentence for both manslaughter and eventually drunk driving. This fueled Clark Wiley to develop a delusional rage, believing society had failed him. He felt he needed to protect his family from the outside world, but as he believed Gina was mentally challenged, he felt she needed even greater protection, trying to hide her existence as much as possible. Clark Wiley proceeded to quit his job and moved his family into his mother's two-bedroom house and further isolated his family. In the second bedroom of the back house, Jeannie was kept for almost all her life. For over 13 hours a day, she was tied to a child's toilet in a makeshift harness, sometimes for a full day, only ever able to move her extremities. She would be beaten if she made noise, barked at, or even clawed at. Her father grew his own fingernails solely to harm her. She was never spoken to, and only had loose scraps of food deposited in the room for her to eat. This lasted for 13 years, or 4,748 days. This morning, the authorities reported that 70-year-old Clark Wiley shot and killed himself just before he was to go to court and be arraigned for child abuse. Clark Wiley was dead, never having gone to court or faced his crimes. He left a note the world will never understand, presumably about Jeannie, her mother was dropped of all charges, the reasoning being her blindness administered by her husband's beatings had left her unable to help. Despite all this, Jeannie was liberated. She was taken to a nearby hospital, undergoing many tests. X-rays revealed the harness had delayed her bone development and she could not focus her eyes further than 10 feet away. She could not even stand up straight or fully extend her limbs. She only knew around 15 words, including her name, stop it and no more which she treated as one word. Her mental capacity matched that of a 13-month-old. Doctors had been given further proof that such isolation leads to the inability to even learn a language. When she got older, she did manage to improve relationships. Her mental capacity did increase with training from psychologists. In 1971, she was placed in her first foster home with Jean Butler. Jean really cared for Jeannie, as Jeannie did for her. She made substantial progress in learning and even improved her language despite being well past the critical period. She conquered her fear of loose dogs, given to her by her father's rabid barking. However, Jean disputed with the research team. She believed the research team were using her and upsetting her, which is not necessarily untrue. On account of this, the research team supposedly blocked her application for custody and pushed for it to go to one of the psychologists of the team, David Riggler. Within the first few weeks of moving in with the Rigglers, Jeannie's incontinence quickly returned especially severe during the beginning. She again became terrified of their dog, regressed in her speech and engaged in highly antisocial and destructive behaviour. It took a long time but Jeannie finally improved. By 1975 she had exceeded expectations and expanded her vocabulary by being able to name most household objects. When she turned 18, Jeannie's mother wanted to care for her again, but within a few months she found herself unable to do so. The next few years, Jeannie hectically moved around, leading her to become deeply sad, believing no one thought her a good enough person. This effectively traumatised her. Jeannie was eventually moved to a care home in LA, where she lives to this day. She is reportedly happy, 
and speaks a little sign language, but barely any verbal language, showing the effects of her development persisted with her to this very day. And so, this video has shown the immense deficits seen within humans that underwent this type of development, with most becoming what we call feral children. It's a truly sad set of cases and hopefully will never occur again. Be sure to subscribe if you enjoyed, and thank you for watching.